The USS Fred T. Berry was a destroyer ship commissioned for Navy use in 1945, mainly being used in the Anti-Submarine Warfare Division from its launch in 1963. It would see action in the Eastern Pacific and throughout the Caribbean before being decommissioned in 1972. No longer seeing use due to its outdated equipment, the Navy decided to sink the large ship intentionally off the coast of Key West, Florida, thus creating an artificial reef. At around 330 feet below the surface of the ocean, government officials felt this was a good idea to help promote marine life in the area. In June of 1973, a team would set out to dive the artificial reef that was just over a year old. The four men, Jock Menzies, Robert Meek, Edwin Clayton Link, and Albert Dennison. They embarked in a dive in the specifically engineered Johnson Sea Link. This submarine-type submersible was designed by Edwin Link after an earlier version called the Deep Diver was deemed unsafe at extreme temperatures. The Johnson Sea Link got its name when J. Seward Johnson of Johnson & Johnson learned that his friend Edwin had been working with the Smithsonian Institution on the development of the Pioneer Mini Submarine, which was designed for deep ocean research. After a $2 million stock donation to the Smithsonian, with additional sums being donated to the tune of $15 million, Johnson would account for the institution's largest received donation. The Sea Link was highlighted by its distinctive 5-foot diameter acrylic bubble, which is in the forward pilot compartment, and provided a panoramic underwater view for the pilot. The rear compartment is considered to be the lockout diving section, which allows two divers to be compressed to the ambient pressure of the ocean and leave the submersible to work underwater. The Sea Link was the first of its kind to be created for this purpose. The team down in Key West, Florida felt very comfortable with the Sea Link and their pilot, Jock Mendes, that day. Jock had piloted the Sea Link about a hundred times over the past two years since its initial launch. Accompanying Jock in the forward compartment was Robert Meek, who was an ocean life scientist as well as a pressure physiologist. In the rear diving compartment was Edwin Clayton Link, who was the son of the very man who designed the submarine that was used that day. With Edwin in the back was Albert Smokey Stover, who was a submarine pilot himself, with many dives piloting the Sea Link. Having a routine dive planned for the day to retrieve and check on some fishing traps that were left next to the sunken destroyer, the men only expected to be in the water for about an hour. Being dressed notably casual, the men were obviously expecting just that. This dive would be number 130 for this specific vessel and would happen on June 17, 1973. On that Sunday morning, the Sea Link was launched from the research ship named Sea Diver, just above the sunken USS Fredberry. According to the subsequent Coast Guard report, shortly after the ship was deployed at 9.45 a.m., Menzies, the pilot, pushed the vessel through the murky waters of the Gulf Stream, and the men would then hear what was described as a harsh, rasping sound of metal rubbing against metal. Being pushed off course by an unexpectedly strong current from the east, the sub had been entangled on a cable and was trapped inside a debris field on the sunken Fred Berry, 330 feet below the ocean surface. The crew alerted the team on the Sea Diver and told them that they were stuck. The team on board called the Coast Guard for rescue and told the men aboard not to exert themselves too much to conserve whatever oxygen was left in the vessel. Being told from below that the crew and the ship was in no immediate danger, the Navy dispatched the submarine rescue ship named the USS Trinka from Key West. The Sea Link and Sea Diver crews considered whether to use the submersible's lockout diving abilities to allow one of the men in the diving compartments to exit the submersible and attempt to free it from the cable. This plan was quickly abandoned because it posed too grave a danger of oxygen toxicity to Link and Stover in the diving chamber. The Sea Link crew and leader, Edwin Link, who was in overall charge of the situation, agreed to await the Tringa's arrival. Levels of carbon dioxide began to rise in the pilot compartment when the CO2 scrubber inside the front compartment failed. Menzies took off his shirt, emptied the carbon dioxide absorbent from the scrubber into it, and held it in front of the circulating fans of the air conditioning unit, which in turn lowered the CO2 level in the pilot's cabin. The Sea Diver crew calculated that the CO2 in the Sea Link would be acceptable levels for around 42 hours in the pilot compartment and 61 hours for the diver compartment. These calculations, however, did not take into account that the diving compartment insulation would be rendered less effective at the lower temperatures seen 300 feet below the ocean surface. 
The acrylic plastic hole of the pilot compartment had a lower heat transfer coefficient than the aluminum hole of the diver compartment, which allowed it to remain at a higher temperature for longer. The USS Tringa arrived on scene at about 4.15 p.m. and proceeded to make a four point more above the sea link. By the evening of June 17th, the internal temperature of the aluminum diving compartment had dropped to near the temperature of the surrounding ocean and was as low as 45 degrees Fahrenheit. By 10 p.m., the absorbent capability of the CO2 scrubber in the diving compartment was exhausted. By 10.25, Link and Stover was directed to begin breathing from the air-supplied masks that were a part of the vehicle. Two hardhat divers from the Tringa attempted to descend to the Sea Link and got close enough to see that the sub was entangled in what looked like a large junkyard, but realized they were unable to help as the vessel was just trapped. A lockout dive by Link and Stover was considered once again, but they expressed their desire not to lock out, and Pilot Menzies and the sea diving crew agreed. By this time, Link and Stover were too cold to attempt such a dive. They had switched over to a helium-oxygen breathing mixture, which resulted in rapid body heat loss. The atmospheric pressure in the diving compartment had by now increased to the ambient pressure of the ocean at the sea link's depth, which was approximately 12 standard atmospheres. Just under an hour later, at 1.12 a.m., Menzies reported to the surface that Link and Stover were suffering convulsions. No further audio communications with Link or Stover took place after this point. A second rescue dive from the Tringa was again unsuccessful, but later that day the commercial salvage vessel, A.B. Wood 2, arrived on scene carrying an underwater television camera with a maneuverable platform. This device, shipped down from the Naval Ordnance Laboratory in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, at a camera that was used to locate the sea link. They then used a grappling hook that was attached to the camera and was able to free one of the sea link's propeller shrouds. Freeing it from the debris field and allowing it to flow to the surface, the sea link subsequently surfaced at 4.53 p.m. Menzies and Meek could immediately be removed from the sea link and were transferred to the decompression chamber aboard the Tringa. However, with the diving compartment being pressurized to the bottom of the ocean, any attempt to remove Link or Stover would have been fatal to them. This was assuming they were still alive. The Sea Link was then transferred to the Sea Diver for medical and rescue attention. Aboard the Sea Diver, Link and Stover were visible through the diving compartment's small viewports, but showed no evident vital signs. Unable to just open the hatch due to the difference in pressure, the compartment was force ventilated with a helium oxygen mixture while remaining pressurized. Hot water was sprayed over it in an attempt to raise its internal temperature. Having to bleed the intense pressure from the compartment before opening it took hours. During usual dives, the sea link is able to depressurize in minutes, which is why the men in the forward compartment were able to escape death and only spend a few hours in the decompression chamber after emerging from the water. Sadly, the two in the rear compartment were still pressurized at 200 pounds per square foot, therefore requiring a slow adjustment in pressure. The next morning, on the 19th, Dr. Youngblood aboard the Sea Diver would conclude that Link and Stover were dead. At that time, the compartment began to sit at a proper pressure and was able to be opened. The two men were dead. Youngblood would go on to say that he believes the two men had died even before making it to the surface. Link and Stover were brought to the Florida Keys Memorial Hospital on Key West, where their autopsies were performed. Both men's cause of death were listed as respiratory acidosis due to carbon dioxide poisoning. The Johnson Sea Link accident was investigated by the United States Coast Guard. The investigators concluded that the accident was caused by pilot error, possibly due to distraction and by the whole shape of the Sea Link. According to the investigators, the submersible's modular construction of irregular shapes and appendages provide an excellent configuration for ensnarement by almost any type of obstruction. In addition to the U.S. Coast Guard investigation, the Smithsonian Institution commissioned an in-house investigation. The report titled, Report of the Johnson Sea Link Expert Review, totaled 121 pages and provided specific observations and recommendations for changes in design and operation of the submersible. Following the death of his son, designer Edwin Link spent the following two years designing an unmanned cable observation and rescue device named Cord, which was designed to free trap submersibles. A second Johnson Sea Link submersible would be designed in the coming years. Nearly identical to the first, it would be launched in 1975. Both the Johnson Sea Link and Johnson Sea Link II remained in operation for many years. 
Their work included examining the wreck of the USS Monitor in 1977 and helping recover the wreckage of the Space Shuttle Challenger after its destruction in 1986. These ships were retired in 2011 after a lengthy tenure in the sea. The Link Foundation established the Albert D. Stover and Edwin Clayton Link Fund, used to support scholarships and oceanography research in 1973. In 1978, Compass Publications established the National Ocean Industries Association Safety in the Seas Award, partly in memory of Link and Stover. That is the story of the Johnson Sea Link disaster. If you want to hear more scary, fascinating stories, make sure to check out last week's video.